We are an independent, spirit-filled church serving the North Fort Worth area. We are Mercy Life Church. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Mercy Life Church. My name is Pastor Tristan, and I am the senior oh. pastor. What? Okay. What happened? You don't have green screen behind your uh, name. Uh, that might that might be the only one though. <laughs> we'll find out. Yes, but. So welcome back to Mercy Life Church. My name is Pastor Tristan. I am the senior pastor here, and I am so excited that you decided to join us today. And before we get into the message, I do want to remind you about our Good Friday service coming up. It will be at 7 p.m. in White Settlement, Texas. And usually we wouldn't have a service that late at night. Usually we would try to have it like around 4 or 5. But because it is on a Friday, we figured it would be easier to get more people, hopefully, in the door. Especially those of you who may work on a Friday or may have kids and doing stuff with the kids. So whatever whatever it may be, we did make it later. So hopefully... Hopefully you can join us. So that is our hope and prayer. And so far we were told a couple people should be joining us and we will be having a worship leader. So that is really, really exciting. We are so excited. And no, Pastor Will won't be the worship leader. Just in case those of you were wondering. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> and you don't have me a mic. I can't comment. Oh. You want to? <laughs> Maybe commenting on something. Um, so, today we are starting a, a two-week mini-series because it just, another Jesus did not feel right for Easter. And heck, I don't know, God might even change the Easter message uh, by the time next week because he's already been working on something in my heart. So, it might even change, and this is new to Pastor Wells. By the way, message might change next week. <laughs> so, and I, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you. So, the message God has been putting on my heart to do on Easter, and I'm really fighting him, is Beautiful Scars. And Pastor Will knows why I'm fighting him about preaching that on Easter. Uh, because that's a very personal message for me. So I am fighting him about preaching that message. So uh, we'll just see what happens. So yes, we are starting a mini-series. And the mini-series is called Impossible Possible. Now, if you look on the screen, you will see that there I have a a graphic that has an X over possible. And but green. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, so we're in a new series. But I want to show you a couple of photos. So you see that it's a paper, you know, that said impossible, but it was snapped in half to make it look like it said possible. I really like that because I figured that would give us more of an idea of what I mean by impossible possible. And then this is one of my favorite photos. As you would see, there's like a big, gigantic scramble mess on top of the photo. But then, it shows like a car driving along it. So, what I liked about that is you see the top part. Ooh, 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 that's right. I forgot I could do this. Yay. Let's see. Is it going to work? Yeah. See this part right here? That part seems impossible. Oh, I love this. <laughs> that part seems impossible. But then, once you get over here to this area then you see that it's it's better. The car somehow got through all of that. Now, how do I make you go away? Done. There we go. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> see, so it looks impossible until you get to the middle part and then the car makes it through. And so, something else I wanted to remind you is when we... Jesus conquered death. We know for a fact that Jesus conquered death. That's the whole reason why we celebrate Easter. But what does death mean to us? Death means like you're gone, no more. Clearly, that's what the word death means, and it's easy. You know, a word that everyone knows. But a lot of us think of death as the grave, because when we die, we go to the grave. Unless we're SDA, then your soul is asleep. But we're not going there. <laughs> But grave doesn't have to mean death anymore. Grave now means victory to us, meaning victory to Christians and those who call on the name of Jesus. So if you call on his name and you are a believer, then you have no reason to be afraid of death. Even if you've been a believer for five seconds, if you just became a believer five minutes ago when Will was doing the, the sinner's salvation prayer thingy, <laughs> 
um, then, then you have no reason to be afraid of death. So, first thing I want to talk about is what is... Oh, hang on. So, my first point is Grave Shaker. And so, let me ask you something. Zoom in. Um, zoom in if you can, too. When you shake something, what are you doing? When I'm doing this, what am I doing? What am I doing when I shake this? I am moving things around. I am causing change. You see? Change? Yes, I am causing change. So, to shake something up. And the way that I'm using it means to cause significant change. What did Jesus do when he was in the grave? He rose, meaning he caused significant change in the grave. So, yeah, so my first point is grave shaker. And actually, let me see if I can do this. I think I can. Yeah, there we go. And so... Let's see. So there are people in the Bible who caused the grave to shake, who shook up the grave many, many times. And so if you will go to Ezekiel 37, we're going to start in verse 3. And so if you will go there, please. He asked me, son of man, can the... Hang on, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. We are Today is not a good day for us. <laughs> he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, here. Can you control the slides? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I thought I asked. I guess I didn't dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make, bre I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I, as I was commanded. And as I, and as, as, <laughs> as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. And there was no breath in them. Now, I want to ask y'all a question. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, so y'all know the song, Rattle by Elevation. This exact scripture is where they got the title of that song from. And if you were here and you saw the homily back in January, then you would also know this. Because I did a homily series covering some of the songs that we sing. Okay, picking up in verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath, come breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Not just one or two, an army. It could have been thousands. Cause it could be hundreds, thousands, heck, even millions. It doesn't say. It just says army. Picking up in verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the, are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are are cut off. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Verse 13, Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your land, in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. You know, something that a lot, you can learn a lot from just that verse alone. There's so much you could talk about. But what I like, what I love about that verse the most is, yeah, let's see where it was. Forget where it was, but he said, okay, verse 7, and it says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. When God commands you to do something, you do it. Simple as that. Hey, Will, was that Ezekiel that did that or... Was that Elijah? 
What the uh, the who, dry bones? Like who was there? Uh, um, Elijah. Elijah. Okay, that's what I was thinking. So, yeah. So no, when no, wait, wait, wait. Ezekiel. This is speak of Ezekiel. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I got a degree. I got a seminary degree, and I still mess my prophets up. <laughs> Okay, let's just go to Second Kings. <laughs> so this one is about Elijah because this yes. is when Elijah dies. I yes. remember this one, yeah. So Second okay. Kings thirteen twenty. So Elijah, not Elijah, but Elisha, who are two different people, by the way. Mm-hmm. Elijah died and was buried. Now Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elijah's tomb. When the body touched Elijah's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Bone touched bones and bones came to life. Basically what happened. And then here's another very famous story in the Old Testament about Jairus' daughter. That's New Testament. Did I say old? Yep. (laughs) New Testament. I can't believe I did that. (laughs) So Luke 8, starting in verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking, I'm sorry, every time I see the those five words while Jesus was still speaking, I think of Peter. <laughs> while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. He said, Don't bother the teacher anymore. Ooh. Hearing that Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Verse 52. Meanwhile, all the people were waiting and mourning for her. Stop waiting. Does that say waiting? Wailing. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. By the way, I just want to point something out. Um, a lot of people like SDA try to say because, of, oh, she is not dead, but asleep. They try to say, oh, that's whole soul sleeping. I'm not even going to get into that, though. So 53, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Verse 55, her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents was astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Just all the people outside uh, Welling are going to (laughs) notice. Okay. Now, we're going to go to John 11. And I think this is about Lazarus. Yeah, this is Lazarus. So... So John 11, starting verse 1. Now, because Lazarus is 44 verses, I didn't actually didn't believe that at first. And then I Googled it. Yeah, it, it's 44 verses, um, which kind of blew me away. Um, but because how long of a story it is, and it's a really good, significant story. But because how long it is, I am actually I actually broke it up into pieces. And Lazarus alone, is you could do a whole series on this story alone. So let's start in verse 11. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, which, by the way, Lazarus was a really close friend of Jesus, really close friend. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Yes, a woman anointed the feet of Jesus, (laughs) whose brother Lazarus was ill. So, the sister sent to him saying lord whom you love is ill but when jesus heard heard it he said this illness does not lead to death it is for the glory of god so that the son of god may be glorified through it now jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus so when he heard (laughs) this is kind of humorous so when he heard that lazarus was ill he stayed two days longer in the place where he was now let's think about this if I go, if I call Pastor Will and I go, hey, um, your friend, but for Andrew, last friend we saw, hey, your friend Andrew is like really, really sick. Like he could die. And then Will would, and then just imagine Will going, I'll be there in a couple of days. 
be like, but he's about to die. I know. I'll be there in a couple of days. Just about how humorous is that? It might not be funny to y'all, but it's funny to me because of the fact that it said multiple times who Jesus loved. Jesus loved all three of them. It just said it, but he still stayed a couple days later. Now, why did he stay? Personally, I believe Jesus stayed longer because he knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew that he wasn't going to die. So, now let's pick up, go to verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, hang on. Let's think about that for a sec. How many times have we blamed Jesus for a circumstance in our life that got, that got worse or that, or that just went horrible? How many times have we blamed Jesus? I hear people all the time, especially unbelievers, blame Jesus for all the horrific events, like what's going on between Hamas and Israel, 9-11, all, all of this. And I hear people blame him left and right for it because they're like, oh, well, God can do, if God can do anything good and he's stopping, he could. I guarantee that he can stop anything he wants to. But sometimes we go through certain things because it builds our character. Sometimes God allows the enemy to attack because it's, it builds our spiritual character. So, next time you are, you're wondering, Jesus, or God, why didn't you do this, or why didn't you change this, just um, think about the fact that God knows how everything's going to end. So, now let's go to verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And then now, verse 25. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now let's go to verse 32. So now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died, would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now, for those who don't know, the shortest verse in the Bible is... Hang on, sorry. John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept, and it's actually uh, you hear it preached at a lot of funerals too. So thirty six. So the Jews said, "See how he loved him," but some of them said, "Could not, could not he open? He opened the eyes of the blind man. Also, have kept this man from dying." Now let's go over to verse thirty eight. See, guys, it, 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 this is a long story. <laughs> then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha, the sister of the dead man, who sa said to him, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for Four days, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, hang on. Let's stop there. How many times has God had to tell us, did I not tell you? <laughs> Just how many times has God told you, did I not tell you not to do that? Did I not tell you not to eat that? Just imagine how many times God has said that to us. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but... I, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his, heart, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbend, unbind him and let him go. Okay, now let's skip over to Matthew 27. Sorry. Do you mind if I uh, comment on go this? Ahead. Um, 
this piece of scripture was actually, uh, we studied this last week uh, mm-hmm. in one of my seminary classes. Um, and so I want you to realize that when Jesus came out, um, his hands and feet were still bound with the linen cr- uh, strips and his face was still wrapped with the cloth. When Jesus came uh, came back from uh, uh, the dead, when Mary walked into the tomb, she found the um, uh, the uh, linen strips laying there on the table, and the cloth was folded. That's right. I I, I forget about that. So very very similar story. Both times, uh, the man had been uh, dead for three days, but um, with Lazarus. Um, uh, he came out still in his grave clothes. Jesus came out in his resurrected body. Mm, okay. So if you will go to Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one, let me. And this is amazing. I love this part. I'm going to point out something that I'm pretty positive most people haven't pointed out. I know two people, Will and Bill, both pointed out mm-hmm. to me. But oh, this is so fun. I actually wanted to do a whole sermon on this. I just couldn't get around to it. Y'all don't understand the week we've had. (laughs) Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the, uh, listen to this, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves. After his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. <clears throat> okay. So, what did we just read? The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, tracking, by the way. Now. When people come back from the dead, who do we think they are? We, we call them zombies. Have you ever heard of this thing called the biblical zombie or biblical zombies? Well, I just, I just introduced you to them right there. They came out of the tombs, out of the graves, meaning they were in the grave. Now they're not. So I just, I always thought that was so freaking cool. And don't yell at me, Baptist, for saying freaking in church. You get over it. <laughs> Freaking Mike. <laughs> okay, so now my next point is grave robber. So just a reminder, grave. Hang on, I made a typo in my notes. I'm trying to wonder what I meant. <laughs> Okay, so do y'all know what grave robber actually means? Well, let me show you a picture and see if you get the idea. Hmm. So I'm, I'll leave it up for a couple seconds so y'all can really look at it. Okay, I, I hope that was long enough. So, a grave robber is someone who would either go, they would either steal jewelry or some, some valuable items out out of the grave, like off of an actual dead body, or they would just take the entire body. Or I also read a line, people who would take like parts of the body and not going to go into detail about how that's done either. <laughs> but so what does the robber do? What does the word robber mean? The word robber means thief, point blank. But when you're a thief, you steal something. But let me ask you a question. If someone stole something from you, then and you take it back, are you really stealing something? A lot of people say that Satan owned the grave. But if you think about it, Satan doesn't owe anything. He doesn't own a single thing. Only thing that he owns, well, I was going to say demons, but he doesn't, I wouldn't even say he owns the demons because those demons he didn't create. But so what I'm trying to get here as Jesus took the grave back from Satan. He, the minute that Jesus raised from the grave, he took the grave back from Satan. So now my next point, and this is another message I have. My next point is why Jesus? Why would anyone in this entire world want to become a follower of Jesus? Why? Why? So I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. Well, I'm going to give you one reason. 
The number one reason why I can think is because Jesus is waiting. Look at this pic. I love it. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup or eat with him and he with me. Jesus is waiting for you. He is waiting for you to open the door. And that doesn't literally mean open your front door and let him in. That means open your heart and let him in. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. This is my final point. Are you ready? Now, I know what you're probably thinking, am I ready for what? Are you? When I got baptized, I got baptized two times. Once at First Baptist White Settlement in White Settlement, Texas. Then I got baptized at White Settlement Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, the first time at the Baptist Church, no one told me a single thing about baptism. All they told me was it was a good idea. That's that's all. Which it is a good idea. It's always a good idea. But if you're going to get baptized, or if you're going to baptize someone, they need to know why they're doing this. I told Pastor, well, I'm not. I refuse to baptize anyone until they tell me why they want to be baptized. Not, not. Oh, because my mom told me to. Oh, because my friends do it. No, you need to have your own personal conviction to be baptized. But so when I was baptized the second time. I was, I got dunked under the water, and I just, I stood there for a sec, and this was the very first time I ever heard the voice of God in the way that I heard it, and I heard a big booming voice in the back of my head ask me, are you ready, and I said, for what, <laughs> I'm like, before I say yes, what am I getting myself into, so God asked me three questions, one, are you ready to lose everything for my glory? Two, are you ready to be used? Three, are you ready to be changed forever? So let me ask you those same questions. One, are you ready to lose everything for my glory? Not my glory, not me. But are you ready to lose everything for the glory of God? To give God all the glory? <clears throat> Stop. Oh my word. Oh, not. Stop. Can they hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. J John 15, starting in verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, talking about Jesus. If you belong to the world, it would have. Wait. If you, if you were the world. Oh, I didn't use the same translation. Okay, well, I'll just read it off here. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That it is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they would persecute you. Also, if they obeyed my teachings, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me if I had not come and spoken to them. They would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done if I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Number two, are you ready to lose, or not lose, are you ready to be used for my glory? Are you ready for God to use you? Because God can do incredible things. God can do all things. He can do whatever you can't do. All, and something that I've learned over the past year, for a couple years, every time I say no, God tells me yes. I said, Lord, I'll preach out of church. I'll even disciple people. I won't run a church, though. I'm not going to be a pastor. That's crazy. Look at me now. I also, well, I didn't exactly tell this to God. I told this to myself. I was like, I'm never going to be an iPhone user. Those people are weird. They are. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, I guess I guess this iPad is also weird. I guess you won't need that later. It's weird. Uh, I guess you won't need to use that anymore. <laughs> and you don't need the Samsung tablet. Technically, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Your story is for God's glory. First Timothy one seventeen to the King of the Ages, immortal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm nineteen one: The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. And number three, are you ready to be changed forever? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Remember that God's love is unchanging and his desire to transform us from within. As we trust in him, he guides our journey towards becoming more and more like Jesus. And now I want to close with something that I hope all of you have heard some point talked about, preached about, or has anyone talked about at one point. Today, I want to close with the question. When you get married and you say yes to your significant other, what are you doing? You are saying goodbye to every other person in this world. You are saying goodbye to all the exes. All the ex-boyfriends, all the ex-girlfriends, all the late night flings, all the rendezvous, you are saying goodbye. But some of us are treating Jesus like he's an ex. An ex that we will call up every now and then and say, hey, how you doing? You want to uh, come over? Or we fit him into our schedule. But if you're the bride of Christ, why are you only making time for your bride when it... When it Oh, what's the word I'm using? What's the word I'm looking for? When it helps you. Why are you making time for Jesus when he only helps you? So today in closing, I am going to close with the song. And this song is so simple. It's like the easiest song you can learn. Maybe the chords might be a little harder. But it's literally come Lord Jesus over and over and over and I just felt it'd be so right for in this moment just say Lord Jesus come so let me go over there and let me get this ready Ugh, I gotta deal with this again yeah. Old original oh, that's not what I wanted. okay we are almost there Oh crap, I took this down. I should not have done that. I'm going to get on you for not capitalizing Lord and Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to fix that right now. You can't have that. Ah oh, crap. I'm almost there. Well, you're still working on that too. Cool. Whenever you are. Okay. I'm pulling it up. Ah! No, I did not do that. Okay. Can can the mic hear me like this? Because I'm tired yeah. of it falling. Okay. Are we at the beginning? There we are. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. He who is to come, he who is to come, 
He who is to come, come, Lord Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. Now we're going to switch over to uh, the final song, which is called He Who Is To Come, which if you didn't tell, these two songs were cre- were made to go hand in hand together. Like it's a nine minute song, basically. There is a day coming when the old will pass away. Every wrong will be made right. No darkness, no night, the sun will light the way. There is a king coming, the one who conquered death and grave. No more pain and no more sorrow. This hope for tomorrow is our hope for today. He who is to come. Oh, no, that's not right. (laughs) He who was, he who is, he who was, he who is, he who is to come. Riding on the clouds with the crown upon his head. Every eye will see him, the nail scars in his hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's only one worthy of our glory and our praise. All wealth and all honor, speak wisdom and power to the Lamb that was slain. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He is surely coming, oh can you feel it too? All the tension growing stronger, it's just a sign he's getting closer. He's already on the move, yeah. The story has been written, we all know how it ends. My future has an anchor. My eyes are on the Savior. He's coming back again. He who is to come. Christ the Son of Man. Riding on the clouds with the crown upon his head. Every eye will see him. With the nail scars in his hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Father, we thank you today that you are a gracious, loving Father, Lord. And we thank you today, Lord, that you will come back one day and that you will set all the captives free, Lord. And we thank you so much, Lord, that you came to this earth as a baby and you left as a king. And we just ask that as we get ready to go into Easter week, we ask that you just remind us of your never-failing love. In your name we pray.